Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Brazos Valley. My name is John Ivey and I am today's worship assistant. I come to this church because I find inspiration and support to resist injustice and work for a better world alongside friends who share my values. We are a welcoming congregation, which means we celebrate and welcome all people of any sexual orientation, race, age, gender identity, ability, or belief. So whoever you are, wherever you have come from, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Honoring the value of spiritual freedom and diversity, we have no statement of doctrine. As a covenanted community, we search for truth and how it applies to ethical living. Unitarian Universalism is a faith of covenant not creed. Welcome visitors. We are very happy to have you join us for worship and hope you'll continue to get to know us better and find us to be the church community you've been looking for. We encourage everyone to visit our website, brazos.uu.org and our Facebook page and group to keep up with what's going on. If if you wish to receive our weekly ecast and our monthly newsletter, contact our administrator at admin at brazos-uu.org, uh, which you should see in the chat box now. On the website, you can sign up to become a digital member of our community. If you want to know what it means to be a member of this church or are interested in joining, please contact our minister, Reverend Christian Schmidt by email at minister at brazosuu.org. Also, you should see that in your chat box now. Reverend Christian is our preacher today, and his sermon today is titled, A Brief History. I want to add my own welcome to that you received and welcome you to worship. Friends, we come from many places. In our lives, whether they've been short or long thus far, we have experienced so much. We have history behind us. As a community together too, we have been through so much over the years of this congregation. And whether we've been a part of it for a short time or a very long time. So today we honor our past, we remember it. And we also remember that it is here to help us, to help us as we move forward into a bright and vibrant future. May it be so. It is now time to light our chalice. I invite you to light your own chalice, if you have one, as I light our chalice today. Please say with me uh, the words for lighting our chalice. We light the chalice the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith as a beacon of hope for all who seek justice, dignity, and compassion, and in celebration of the life of truth and meaning we share together. Now please join me also in reading our affirm, uh, affirming the mission of our church. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its gift. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Thank you. 
And I hope uh, everyone was singing along. I like to sing along with those at home. Uh, it's time for all ages. It's our time for all ages. And today we're talking about history. Um, and I had hoped to have a really cool media presentation for you. This is my computer crashed and lost it. So I'm doing this. Uh, you just get me instead. Um, but what I'm going to do today is talk about a little bit of a timeline to give us some perspective of the scope of history. Um, about ourselves, about our congregation, about the history of Unitarian Universalism, about the history of our country. Um, so I'm going to say some years, one at a time, and I'll give you a few moments to think about what the significance of that year might be, and then I'll sort of answer what I think the significance is, at least one important thing from that year. Um, so the first year is the year 1776. So this might be the easiest one, maybe. Um, but our country, of course, declared its independence in 1776. Um, and given the sort of um, political situation, a lot of talk about the uh, Constitution and everything, I thought it was important to talk about the founding of our country, especially as it's deeply intertwined with the founding of Unitarianism and Universalism in North America. So 1776 is the first date, about 250 years ago almost. The second date I wanted to talk about is 1788, because that's 12 years later, and I wanted to bring up the fact that our nation's constitution, which we value so highly, was not ratified until 1788, 12 years later. Um, of course, the Articles of Confederation were the first form of government. Um, but in 1788, the Constitution was ratified by New Hampshire, which is the ninth of the 13 states to ratify it, putting it into effect. At least two-thirds of the states had to ratify it. Um, so 1788, 12 years later. Eight years after that, in 1796, is a really important date for the history of Unitarian Universalism, but probably not for the country as a whole. 1796 was the first time that Universalists gathered together and made what eventually became the Universalist Church of America. That is, they jointly gathered to have an association in which they would talk about how they governed their churches together. 1796, so well more than 200 years ago, the first Universalists already existed and were coming together to talk about how they could be stronger together. Flash forward a few decades, to 1825, and our Unitarian ancestors essentially did the same thing. They had a gathering, mostly of ministers, but to come together to form what would eventually become the American Unitarian Association. So that was the founding of the sort of formal association of Unitarians in America. There are plenty of many, many, many dates we could talk about over the next century, but I'm going to jump forward a little now and talk about the year 1956. Can anybody tell me what the significance of the year 1956 is to our congregation? Just shout it out. You can unmute yourselves and tell me. Is it when our church was founded? Absolutely. Unitarian Universalist Church of Brazos Valley, or rather what would become that name, was founded by a small, hearty group of uh, beginners, of uh, founders, um, so we celebrate that date. Uh, that's an important date in our history and one I like to bring up often. Five years later to 1961 is a really important date in the history of Unitarian Universalism. It's when after many, many decades of discussions and negotiations, 
the Unitarian, the Universalist Church of America, rather, and the American Unitarian Association merged into what is now called the Unitarian Universalist Association. They became one organization together. It was the founding of what we now call Unitarian Universalism, though obviously our roots go much, much deeper, as I've just mentioned. To give a little sense of history and how far back things go, I like to use the date 1977. Does anyone have any thoughts about something important that happened in 1977? Was anyone born in 1977 here, perhaps? No? The thing I want to talk about that happened in 1977 to give you an idea of how time flies is that Star Wars debuted in 1977, 43 years ago. We could flash forward again, obviously many important dates in the 80s and 90s, but I want to go forward to 2006, an important date in my history with this congregation, because that's when I became a member of the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Brazos Valley. And then I wanted to give one more important date, uh, 2017, um, when we had the, the final worship service and moving out of our longtime home on Welburn Road. Now we could talk about all sorts of different dates that are important for history. When we're talking about the history of our congregation, the history of Unitarian Universalism, I like to do this to give some context of how long our roots go back. We can talk about hundreds and thousands of years ago too for some of our roots. And hopefully our future extends decades and centuries forward too. Whether any individual or not is part of that, our community will continue on we have a long history behind us and a long future in front of us. May they both be blessed. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, thank you. If we were having worship service in person, this is a time when we would pass the basket. This church shares the proceeds of the offering plate donation every week to support important nonprofit organizations with which we work. We are very proud to support UU The Vote for September and October. Many of us are working on this grassroots effort to engage and inform voters who need to reclaim their voting power. Remember, your vote is your voice and your power. If you wish to make an offering, you can mail your check or for your convenience, you can donate online. On our homepage at brazos-uu.org, you can find our mailing address at the bottom. And at the top, you will see a Donate Here tab to click to see donation options. You will see that uh, donation information in your chat, chat box now. May each of us look into our hearts, how much love, how much generosity, how much faith, how much gratitude, and how much hope is there? We give thanks for these gifts we have given, for those we receive, and for each other. Invite us all to take a moment to prepare ourselves for a time of prayer, meditation, and sharing. Be comfortable wherever you are seated. And close your eyes if you feel comfortable doing so. Take a deep breath or two in and out. In. Spirit of life and of love, there is so much right now. So much in the world, so much in our nation, so much in our communities, so much in our families, 
so much in our hearts and ourselves. It's too much. The continued assaults on our democracy, war, violence, poverty, hunger all around the world, even the loss of yet another beloved figure this week, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a huge legal figure and an advocate for equal rights. It can be too much to deal with. And yet we must. We have to keep going, but we don't have to do it alone. We can ask for help. We have to do the things we can, but remember that we can do mo no more than that. Today, we ask for the strength to cope even too much. May we have the wisdom to know what in the world is too much and what we might do with that. May we remember always that we are never, ever alone. So for all of us dealing with too much, may we find some solace here in our gathering and in the knowledge that we are loved, we are supported, and that whatever we have to give is enough. I invite us now to join together again to share our joys and concerns, those things weighing down our hearts and those things lifting them up that we cannot help but share. We know there are many joys, sorrows, and concerns among us. I invite you now to express any joy or sorrow you wish to share with everyone in the chat box and let us hold in our hearts any unspoken words. We particularly think of those affected by hurricanes potentially coming soon again, by those affected by fires in the western part of our country, by all those suffering from oppression from poverty, and for all of those who are suffering with the effects of coronavirus and for those they love. Now please share your joys and concerns so that all of us may hold them together. Our reading today comes from my friend and colleague, the Reverend Sean Neal Barron. It's titled, A History of Church, Including Yours. He writes, One day, your church was born. Maybe it was the gathering of saints called together for the common worship of a wrathful God ceaselessly praying between bouts of decrying the evil of Christmas or of dancing. Or maybe a few brave souls answered a notice in the newspaper. Paper. Curiosity piqued by the announcement of a religion where free thinking and tolerance were bedrocks. No matter how it happened, your church was born. A gathering of people, humble, caring, anxious and quirky, all at the same time, who covenanted to be with one another on the journey of life, death, and everything in between. So it began. A faithful few, beautifully imperfect, called to that central task, that human task, of connecting, loving, and serving. It was just a baby, 
and yet it was thrust deep in the human condition. Tasked to hold minds and souls, bodies and hearts along the roller derby of disease and birth, infighting and joy, and Christmas pageants. Sometimes all of those at the same time. They gathered to hear the world broken open for insightful sermons, rejuvenating music, and community whose fierce devotion to each other's well-being rivaled a mama's mama bears for her cubs. But it wasn't always like that, of course. There were the trying times, and I don't just mean Phyllis or Jack, those stubborn but lovable souls who inhabit the nether world of committee meetings. No, I mean the trying times, when the church almost split in half over the war on integration, or when the mill left the town vacant, or when the minister crossed that line and people couldn't speak about it for decades. But somehow, you were still there. Still on the town common, still the church that everyone recognizes, still the ones that show that shows up every time you're called on still using the communion silver until you voted to sell it new people came and they changed things small things big things things that nobody notices that happened until suddenly it was hard to even recognize anything anymore and that was a hard moment a tearful moment and other things changed too the proclamations about god once heard Loud from the pulpit softened. Wrathful became loving. Distant became intimate. Mandatory became optional. After the war, the nursery and RE classrooms were overflowing. Each baby dedicated reminded the church of the incredible beauty of life and the gift this community, all huddled around baby, would bestow upon this child. The history of your church is more a story of the determination of love to break forth than it is about tie-dye or chalices or sermon discussions or even social justice committee meetings. The history of the church is the history of human enterprise, evolving in its sights and sounds, yet evolving always around its core. The history of your church is the gift of potential and momentum, of baggage and personality. The history of your church is the launch pad from which you spring into action or disarray. Each day, your church is born. And this is a song we all know. Please stay muted, but sing along with me from home. It's Bob Dylan. These times they are changing. Come gather round people wherever you roam And admit that the waters around you have grown And accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone If your time to you is worth saving And you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone For the times they are a-changing Some writers and critics prophesize with your pen And keep your eyes wide, the chance won't come again And don't speak too soon, for the heart still spin And there's no telling who that it's naming For the loser now will be later to win For the times they are a-changing The line it is drawn, the curse it is cast The slow one now will later be fast As the present now will later be past The order is rapidly fading And the first one now will later be last For the times they are a-changing So I should have started 
apologizing. I didn't mean um, in to preach about history this Sunday to cause our uh, president to suddenly have a newfound interest in whitewashing our history, but sometimes that's how things roll. Earlier this week, there was a flare-up, as I assume many of you have heard, in the ongoing battle over our nation's history. As I said, the president proclaimed that he will be supporting a new initiative, the 1776 Commission, to promote, quote, patriotic views and history in our schools. Given the background of this and the sources from which these patriotic programs are drawn, we know this isn't some well-intentioned effort to bring back civics education. It's clear this is Orwellian doublespeak. Patriotism is not the point, but rather, as I said, a whitewashing of our history. In order to support a view that America is somehow a spotless, blameless exemplar, a view that supports our status quo, a view that makes people in power feel good about having that power, in short, a view that is white supremacist through and through. It's a not at all small step on the fascist road, a dangerous move in our nation. Now these feelings stand in stark contrast to the mainstream of historians who have increasingly been pushing for a more honest assessment of our nation's history, complete with flaws, including the problematic parts of its founding that we often elide. I think particularly here of the work of the journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones, who led the 1619 Project, recounting how the enslavement of African people was crucial and central to the development of America. Her work and the work she led has been a shining example of this critical approach to our history. The project named for the year in which the first enslaved Africans were brought to what would become the United States delves into the complicated, awful, and heartrending history of slavery and how deeply it is intertwined with all of American history. The United States would not exist in anything like the form it is now without that slavery past. What it might have looked like without such horrors, we'll never know. And so I say all this to make the point that history matters. History matters. We are inescapably the result of our history, though we are not bound to repeat it. Indeed, as the saying by Jorge Santillana, often called George in English, and famously paraphrased by Winston Churchill goes, those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So we have to know our history, and we have to actually learn lessons from it. And this is not easy work. We've learned that over and over again. So when I say that history matters, I mean that our personal history, what we do and do not acknowledge from it matters. Our nat national history matters too. Again, what we lift up and what we try to sweep under the rug. And this congregation's history matters, as does the place it takes in the larger history of Unitarian Universalism. Now, none of us, and certainly not I, know all the pieces, all the dates, all the stories. There are members here who know that history of UUCBV better than I ever will. All of those things matter. And just as much, the myths we tell matter. And when I say myths, I don't mean that they aren't true. I mean, what are the stories and values and moments that we hold up as most emblematic of who we are? I had the good fortune this week, our administrator Nancy was going through pictures from our history and found one of me sharing some words at the goodbye service to our former home on Welburn Road. I came into town for that. I didn't want to miss it. There are no doubt many lessons we can learn and in the interim process this year, we'll continue to engage that, notably as the part of the process of reaffirming and refining our mission and vision. 
We'll soon have more information to share about that process, and I hope that all of you will participate in the process. But that picture Nancy shared made me think of the story I've often heard of the meeting to decide to buy that building on Welburn Road. A Baptist church was closing, and we all we had to do to have their building was take over the mortgage payments. And yet even that was a daunting amount of money for a fledgling congregation just a few years old. Members of D came up with the money, and we had a home for the next 60 years. In this time in which we're moving forward with a building project for our next home, that story rings loud in my ears. Is it calling us to do that very thing? Is it a warning? Is it all of the above? I don't know. But I think of it often and how important it has been to our identity as a congregation. I think of the ministers I've known here over the years, the ones I met who served before my time with this congregation too, all of them well-intentioned, imperfect people, including me, matched with a bunch of well-intentioned, imperfect congregants in what we call a religious community. The stories I remember most of UUCB are about our work in the community of hosting a daycare that was racially integrated at a time when that was controversial, or of the times we built through Habitat for Humanity, or our involvement in various food pantries over the year, or the space we constantly and consistently provided for speakers and musicians for gatherings of so many kinds, some of them gatherings that no one else in our community was willing to hold. I think of the people I've met in this community and how it has held them at their worst moments, celebrated with them at their best, and been a steady influence in their lives, challenging them, supporting them to be their best. I think of all those ministers, all those leaders, all those people I've known here. And I think of my own journey with this congregation, how it's always felt to me that it's my home even if I'm far away. And of course, we've failed. We've not lived up to our best selves. We've failed our covenant. We've done so many things. We perhaps said things we wish we hadn't or walked out when we wish we had stayed in relationship through hard discussions. I remember angrily storming out of a gathering once myself, though in my defense, I came back quite soon. To ignore these would be hypocritical. It would not serve us well as we embark on a new era of the life of this congregation. We will have new opportunities in our new location. And in the pandemic and post-pandemic worlds we are and will one day be in. To learn from our failures will be important as will holding on to our many triumphs. And again, we'll engage this all more fully in the year to come. But I want to say a word about covenant. Our covenant, our agreement about the ways we will be together in community is what holds us together. Our history as Unitarian Universalists is one of covenant. Covenants, again, those agreements about how we will be together have been a part of our tradition for centuries. Indeed, in some ways, for thousands of years, go far back enough. The Cambridge Platform, written in 1648, is essentially a long covenant, a plan for how churches would be formed and run here in the Americas among the people, some of them who would be eventually become Unitarians. My first ministry was at the first parish in Malden, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. And I learned during the course of my time there that one of my predecessors as minister had actually signed that platform in 1648. More recently, we have covenants in our congregation, as many do, that talk about how we will behave. They are formed among us, voluntarily entered into, drawn from our history, including the Cambridge platform, and they shape the way we behave now and will behave into the future. Most crucially for many of us, covenants mean 
we don't have to believe the same exact things. Instead, we focus on how we are going to be together, how we will act in community, what support and love we will provide for one another, even when we disagree. For you use, perhaps that matters more than most. So friends, we have a proud history and one we can learn from. This congregation has such huge potential. Our ministry is so needed in Bryan and College Station. And much of that ministry is coming into shape as we prepare for a new era of settled ministry in a new location with a new building. We will bring to that our history and it can support us as we move boldly into the future. I'm excited to be your interim minister. I hope you're excited still to be a part of this community. Thank you. We are building a new way. We are building a new way. We are building. Now please join me in extinguishing the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we gather together again. Our benediction today. From the proud history of our church, we turn now to its future. With all of us working together to hold our covenant, to live our mission, to become our vision, we have a bright 64 years ahead of us, too. Our worship has ended and our service begins.